Greetings and welcome to another episode of Discussions with Indigenous Education, the Genocide of the Dark Skin Indian. I'm your host, Tavis Sanders, also known as Red Tail Hawk. I'd like to welcome our co host, Renee Sanders, also known as Red Silver Fox. Greetings, everyone. Uh, well, this is part two of discrimination, stage four of the 10 stages of genocide, right? And uh, we talked about, well, you know what? I think that we should read um, discrimination this time as a stage, and let's read the whole thing. Okay. okay. All right. All right. Did you want to read it? You want me to read it? Okay. Well, I, I can read it. Okay. Okay. Mm. Discrimination. A dominant group uses law, custom, and political power to deny the rights of other groups. The powerless group may not be accorded full civil rights, voting rights, or even citizenship. The dominant group is driven by an exclusionary ideology that would deprive less powerful groups of their rights. The ideology advocates mo monopolization or expansion of power by the dominant group. It legitimizes the victimization of weaker groups. Advocates of exclusionary ideologies are often charismatic, expressing resentments of their followers, attracting support from the masses. Okay, and then there's just some examples. Examples include the Nuremberg Laws of 1935 in Nazi Germany, which, uh, which stripped Jews of their German citizenship and prohibited their employment by the government and by universities. All right, and so, yeah, and that's the whole stage if, inter if individuals are interested in reading it. And um, again, they, they talked about laws, customs, and political power, right? And so we talked about the laws and the customs in the last show. And so this show, well, let's you know, talk about political power and a larger uh, idea of this discrimination uh, you know, as far as the genocide of a dark-skinned Indian. And so let's define political power for, uh, for our audience. Okay. All right. I, uh, okay, I'll read it. I guess you did just get finished reading, right? <laughs> <laughs> political power is defined as social causation in which the first actor causes changes in the behavior of a second actor. Hmm? <laughs> well, that was a good answer, definition for me, right? Go ahead, let's, let's give us a, a more simpler definition, right? Okay, it's a little longer, but it's, yes, uh, a little easier to understand, I think, okay? For people okay. like me, okay. Okay, political power refers to the ability to influence or control the behavior of people institutions or governments, typically through the use of authority, persuasion, or coercion. It involves the ability to make decisions, enforce laws, and shape policies that affect society. Political power can be wielded by individuals, groups, or institutions, and is often associated with concepts such as government, leadership, and governance. Mm, okay, so I think that we got it good gist of it. Now, it's so interesting enough, um, there are types of political power that I can think of, right? And, um, and as we are reading the discrimination and how discrimination is, are used against dominant groups, I think about uh, the MAGA world today, right? And the influence that white America, right? White Christian America has had on our country since it's is founding and how, you know, one might say their leader, you know, a charismatic individual that perpetuates hate and violence and negativity against, you know, so mar more marginalized populations, you know, particularly brown and black people, right? And just how we really need to be careful in today's world. You know, we're talking about the genocide of a specific group our group. However, there's a larger issue happening here within the world, and this is just, it's, it's hard for me not to say something about that here right now. Yes, well, we, we, we are living through this political power. Yeah, yes, 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 yeah, yeah. So, you know, let's, you know, well, let's take a break for a minute, because the political power is, is, a, is a thing, right? And 
we just, you know, introduced the show. We just went over the definition. But we really want to get into it. I don't want to take any more breaks for a minute. So we're going to take a break here. Greetings and welcome back. Uh, before the break, we were talking about stage four discrimination and political power as an aspect of uh, discriminatory tactics with respect to uh, genocide, right? And we defined, you know, what political power is. However, it's so much more that's involved with that. You know, um, when I was doing research, you know, we found political power, but then there types of political power, there are stages of political power, there are faces of political power. And so it was like, okay, how can we organize this in a way that would make sense for our view viewing audience, you know, centered on uh, the darker skinned indigenous population. And so we, let's, I guess we could begin with the political uh, power and the tactics. There's uh, military power. Okay. There is diplomatic power, mm. economic power, legal power, cultural power, and bi biological power. Interesting. Interesting. Yes. Right. And so again, we are. We talked about the legal and the cultural a little bit, and we talked about the law and cultures in the last show. And so let's so let's start from the top. We're talking about the various uh, types. Right, these are types of political power. And I think you said the first one was uh, military power. Yes. Yeah. So military power. European colonists often used military force to conquer and control Native American lands. This included warfare, force removals, and the establishment of military outposts. Mm, mm, mm. I would include missions in that too. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because you know, the religion was a, a tactic of war that the European used. Oh, yes. Oh, you yes. Know, so, you know, I, I definitely, and um, so let's give an example, um, you know, because, you know, we want the audience to be able to relate, right? Mm -hmm. So let's give an example of a military power being used against a indigenous peoples. Well, can you say any of their explorations? <laughs> oh, oh, is that what they are? That, well, <laughs> that's, that's what we call them in the history books. Mm -hmm. yeah. They called them slave raids at the time, right? Uh, oh, yes, they did. Yeah, yeah. okay. It's just a difference in time. <laughs> you know, interesting enough, we also talk, you know, we're talking about the, you know, the conquering and the control, too, right? Mm -hmm. And one of the things about um, genocide is that you have to show, it's difficult to show cause that these things happen and that the intent was for these things to happen, and which is really why we consistently go back into the history books and not only, you know, show you the event, but we also talk about the propaganda centered around uh, the marketing of that particular event today. But, you know, you get into the journals and stuff, they tell you what they were doing, right? <laughs> oh, yeah, what the intent really, really was. <laughs> right. And, um, you know, I have, I'm, I'm looking down here underneath military power, and I see um, adelanta what, uh, adelantados, right? Yes. Well, this, and those were the men who were put in charge of these explorations, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. These exploratory explorations. Uh, and these people that we now call explorers yeah we call them the explorers ponce de leon and um, de soto uh, and de soto all yeah they yes they we have them in our history books that they're such <laughs> bizarro <laughs> <laughs> yes and what they were they were given these titles on de uh because they they were military commanders uh who had shown their valor <laughs> in previous military expeditions where now they are now put in charge of an entire war party <laughs> basically right. so mm -hmm. that's basically what these expeditions were they were war parties right and so in these explorers they were military soldiers they were like they were generals military soldiers, and things yes. like that and their one mission was to conquer yes and then they make it sound cute today because they call them explorers <laughs> as if they were looking for things, and in, in actuality, they were, they were really looking for 
things to kill and places to take. And again, and and they were given that that title because of their their valor in wars already. Okay, so you could say, in some sense, that because the United States is mis is using pro uh, using propaganda and misidentifying these um, individuals that they created into heroes, rather than acknowledging who they really were, it's intentional, mm -hmm. right? And so, you know, we talk about, you know, intent matters a lot. And if mm -hmm. these people were slavers, they slaved a specific population, and you don't want to call them that, you want to say that they explored, you know, that's, <laughs> uh, but we're going to move forward, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and one more thing um, with respect to this military power is uh, the War Department. And maybe you want to talk about that a little bit, or you want me to? Well, <laughs> the War Department, which is interesting, <laughs> which is where the Indians were placed mm -hmm. in the Department of War, because that's we were they the they were in war <laughs> against the indigenous people, mm -hmm. and so they created a department within the War Department for these. Indians, okay, that later became um, the BIA, well, Department first of Interior. The, the first, no, first it became um, uh, when they when when they created something for uh, the Department of Indian Affairs, okay, something like that, and then they moved that into the Department of Interior, where they took it out of the War Department. Okay. Okay, but see, that all happened like in in. In the 1800s, mm -hmm. like 1825, or even maybe even beyond that, is when they, yeah, it was I think 1847 or something like that, is when they finally removed the the Indians from the War Department and put them in the interior. Well, they had considered the they had reached the specific the Pacific uh, now, and so they they didn't have any need to go to war. They had conquered all of the lands at that point. Right. Yes. And so now it's just about uh, assimilation, you know, is not about the subjugation anymore. They have subjugated us and they have taken control of all of the land. But we need some specifics. We can't talk about it. We want to make sure we at least give you one or two of these military issues that, you know, fit underneath this uh, political power. And oh, so, oh, well, <laughs> that, that list is, <laughs> oh my goodness. Well, here we could just list a few of yeah, them. Let's again. Get to yeah, them. just a few, but sheesh, all you need to do is read through your history books and you can find anymore. Okay, okay there were wars against the uh, indigenous, they called it the indigenous Powhatan Wars. Mm -hmm. And so that, they said from 1609 to 1614, and then again from 1622 to 1632. Okay, mm -hmm. that was against the Powhatan tribes. Okay, we have the Pequot War. Uh, which was over the, uh, the, the, the fur trade. That was from 1636 to 1637. We have King Philip's War, and these wars, these were uh, up in the Northeast. Okay, that is from uh, 1675 to 1676, and that was the, uh, against the Wapanoag tribes in New England. We have the French and Indian War, which was a very large conflict, but, and, and it was also, in, overseas, so the United States, and it, it was not just being fought over here, uh, and it was called the Seven Years' War, okay? And both sides used the indigenous people for that one. <laughs> we have the Northwest Indian Wars, okay? We have the Seminole Wars. <laughs> so, and again, we could go on and on. <laughs> right, 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 right. And, and again, you know, we're talking about uh, uh, tactics used against the indigenous population um, as a part of discriminatory uh, uh, discrimination, you know, from a genocide perspective. And we mentioned it, we said it was a military power, diplomatic power, economic power. So let's talk about the diplomatic power. And we kind of did already, you know, yeah, through the did, military, yeah. but just to, you know, go over and make sure and that. And again, with the Department of War and everything. Yeah, yeah. so uh, with the diplomatic power, yeah, through the Department of War, Indian agents 
were uh, they were responsible for managing Indian relations and negotiating treaties. So this is what the purpose of the Department of War was supposed to be. Mm -hmm. And you had these agents that are engaging with the Indian tribes. Wait a second, tribes. wait a second, wait a second. You're telling me that you're going to engage and make a treaty with me underneath a department that's called war? <laughs> that, that's I'm supposed what to they trust did. that? Yes, what they did. <laughs> okay. yes. yes, indeed. What was their true intention? <laughs> yeah. right? Okay, well, it says that many of these treaties were broken. Okay. okay. And, but then they, yeah, they were used to manipulate and dispossess native peoples from their lands, mm -hmm. okay. Mm -hmm. Says the indigenous people were included in the Department of War, yeah, here it is, until 1849, when the Bureau of Indian Affairs was transferred to the newly created Department of the Interior. Okay. And then, like you said, at this point now, uh, I guess they're, they're, the, the, the wars are no longer needed because we, if, at this time, 1849, they have already had their removal Mm -hmm. And and again, that's another uh, where they used military power right. to remove the citizens from their homeland all the way over uh, uh, to the west of the Mississippi River. They they had to use military power to for that to be successful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and and again, and and that happened in 1832 and or in the 1830s and so by close to 1850 you know um that's all settled over there you know so now yeah we 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 don't need that anymore so we'll just put now we'll put them into the interior now mm -hmm. we don't have to p keep making wars with them all right yep and, and so now you know we have another we stage continue, yeah even though they <laughs> 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 um, and so now we have another stage right and then we're moving on to the next stage which is uh economic power right and so let's let's and again we're talking specifically about the tactics, these tactics used as a part of the development of the united states right and we're going to talk about something else in a moment but just wanted to make sure they knew the time span that we're for okay well, economic power it says the uh, colonists' control over trade and resources allowed them to economically dominate Native American tribes, leading to dependency and loss of economic autonomy. Mm-hmm, mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, we wanted to give three examples, right? We want to say, okay, you know, let's use three examples of how the colony used you know the ec economics against us, right? And uh, and then we're gonna talk about something else for today, my mom. But we let's talk about it real quick. Tobacco. Well, that was the first thing. <laughs> the very first thing. The very first thing, and they even stole. <laughs> mm -hmm. They 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 stole the seeds that they got so that they could start this 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 tobacco up in Virginia, and that became their largest. Um, that was the Export. cash crop. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that was why the colony survived, really. Yes, yes, it, it is. It's the it only is. reason why. Yes. All right, we talk about rum. Mm -hmm. mm, interesting enough, I have a little bit about this one, and that's that, interesting enough, Rhode Island was the number one rum maker in the Americas. There, and Rhode Island also was the port that sold or shipped the most Africans. Interesting enough, you wouldn't think that Rhode Island would have shipped the most Africans, but they show they shipped the most Africans from the uh, from Africa to the islands and would exchange the slave for the sugar cane. And so while they say that when you read history, you would think that oh, okay, the mo uh, the most amount of Africans that arrived in the United States came from Rhode Island. Well, no, they actually didn't really come to Rhode Island that much, but they are counting Rhode Island as the number one shipper of slaves, even though they didn't bring them to the United States. So, that, you know, a little bit of trick with history that we have to pay attention to. But rum was the cash crop for Providence, New England, Boston area, you know, and so that was their reason for surviving. They were able to bring rum back to, uh, to actually they were shipping it everywhere. Okay, but one of the one of the biggest things mm. was uh, fur. Fur. Well, you know, and they, the the British and the Spanish also they depended on the indigenous people 
to to produce these furs because they were the ones that kn that and knew how to do it. They were working with these animals for centuries. We knew how to hunt them. They knew how to hunt them, uh, and and so they utilized the indigenous people for that. But then, of course, with with, with economics, they they you know they. <laughs> they 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 use so many furs that the animals were starting to mm. deplete and mm. so the, mm. so and so that's really kind of what happened with the indigenous people and with the fur trade and everything. Mm, mm. Interesting, interesting. And um, today, I just would like to highlight that today, um, economics is used as a uh, a tactic of political power because again, as we discussed, if uh, the United States if you do not uh, follow, if if you don't fall within the guidelines of what the United States has um, issued in law to be uh, Indian or a Native American, you're not allowed to be that. And they use the BIA and funding of institutions as a way to prop up s groups that they would like to be acknowledged as Indians, and then not fund groups that they do not want to be identified as an Indian. And that's a, a tactic that is being used today that highlights and showcases the genocide that is still occurring um, um, against us today. You know, I think people also need to realize that when, when, when we hear the term recognized, you know, is, is this tribe recognized? And basically, the, the recognition means that they are recognized to receive federal funding from the United States. Mm -hmm. That's all that recognized means. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. To, to, to receive funding. Right. And so you, you qualify based off of all standards to receive funding for your group. And uh, if that makes you indigenous, then, you know, we are in a really bad place. Right? Yeah, and because we know how how dark-skinned people were not allowed to be Indians, <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. then it's like, what, 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 what can one do? Right. Mm -hmm. Because of the laws that were there, how, 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 do, how do you combat this? Because they created and put those things in, in and ingrained it in law. Right, right, right. Okay, well, you know, it's going to be, it's, it's almost time for us to wrap it up, right? Um, but before we wrap it up, there's one more aspect of political power that I wanted to at least glance over so that the audience, you know, would be able to get a little bit, go into it a little further if y'all so choose to, right? Was that the biological power? Or, or, or you wanted the faces? Yeah, I wanted to talk about the faces of political power. Okay, um, but I however, do we do want, need yeah. to talk about biological. Yeah, the biological power, yeah. yeah, we do need because it was utilized, mm -hmm, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and basically, you know, many people think it, uh, that it was utilized as far as bringing over diseases and, and, and these were killing the native people. However, if we really look at those numbers when when this was when they were coming in, that 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 they weren't dying from diseases. The reason why these numbers were diminishing is because they started getting counted as a, as, as as they weren't being counted as the people that they were. They were starting to be counted as slaves. If you're a slave, they are from Africa, and so now that that part of it. We're not talking about the tens of thousands of indigenous um, peoples that were uh, shipped off of the mainland um, into the islands and, and, you know, then placed into that slave trade. Nobody ever talks about the individuals that they tricked onto the boats when Columbus first got here and those Native Americans that wound up in the Mediterranean slave trade over there, right? And you know, and what about all the indigenous people from Mexico and from Brazil and from South America that were used as slaves? We're, the indigenous mm -hmm. people. And were, were used as slaves. Yes. And so, and, but that's okay because, you know, y'all are African now. Right. And, and that's a tactic to because use. Because they were shipped in on a boat. Because they were shipped on, on a boat through laws. Now that you, if you came in here by boat, you're African. Even if you left from Carolina and went up north to Virginia, which we know that they did, we, we just spoke to you about some of that, right? And so there's so much, and it still relates today, right? 
But let's think. Let's let's just go over just one more thing, and that's the uh, we talked about tactics, and um, but they're also faces of political power, right? And uh, it's time for us to wrap up the show today, so we won't be able to get into it. But I at least want to list them and then read what they are before we close it out today, right? So let me list them, and then I'll let you read each one uh, before we wrap it up. Okay, all right. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so the first uh, face of political power is decision making. The second is agenda setting, and the third is thought control. So you know, with, you know, hopefully within the next ten minutes we can go over this real quick, and then we could wrap it up for the day. Right? Okay. All right. Well, and these things, oh goodness, are so important because we need, we need to recognize these things and be aware of these things today. Okay. You know? Well, you know what? With that being said, let's take a break because we don't need to rush this. So we're going to take a break here, and when we'll get back, we'll start to talk about the faces of political power and how this, this affects us as a darker-skinned indigenous pop population. So we'll be right back with more discussions with indigenous education the genocide of the dark skinned Indian. Welcome back to Discussions with Indigenous Education, the genocide of the dark skinned Indian. Right before the break, we were about to go over the faces of political power, right? And again, let me list it and then my mom so again, the, the three are decision making, agenda setting, and thought control. All right. Okay, so, <clears throat> excuse me, decision making. The first phase of power is the most easily recognizable. Decision making is the process whereby an actor, such as an individual or a political organization, considers their situation and acts upon a course they have determined. Decision making might then take into the account both coercive and non-coercive action. Could this possibly be the recognition and the federal funding of specific Indians versus mm -hmm. other Indians? Mm -hmm. You know, and interesting enough, let's read the next one. Okay, okay. agenda setting. Agenda setting. <clears throat> the second phase of power involves controlling the parameters of a discussion. Mm. One might want to do this, for example, so that the participants of the discussion might not even be able to address things that are in their benefit. Um, and could, could that possibly be or the difference between tribal and indigenous and in how the laws of the United States are set up so that in order to work with them, you literally have to give up your uh, autonomy, your, your legal rights as an indigenous person, and, and, and now you've acquiesced authority, and you don't even know that you've done it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, that happened a lot. <laughs> Every, oh my gosh. Okay, what's the third one? Thought control. Mm. Hmm. Wouldn't it be even easier if, rather than preventing somebody discussions, discussing something, we could prevent somebody from even realizing what is in their real interest. In reality, this happens all the time and is one of the most important issues to address in the study of politics. Interesting. And again, I'm going to continue on with the same reference. If the people do not know that there's a difference between tribal and indigenous, and the United States uses that to prop up the, the group that they can have legal authority to control, is that not a, a, a means of coerce, uh, uh, coercion? Coercion. Co coercion? Mm -hmm. yeah, it's, yeah, it's very, very, very manipulative. And I wanted to just show and highlight how um, this is on, we're really only glancing over um, uh, the, these points and it's so much more in depth uh, information in depth uh, co conversations to be had with respects to what this really means to us as a darker skinned indigenous population. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, this has been an interesting show, right? Mm -hmm. Discrimination. We could have really gone into the depths of um, uh, 
again, Jim Crow, or some of the other things, but it's too much to do. We really needed the people to have an idea of the definitions, different tactics, different faces, as they say, right? And the thing is, is that as we go forward, uh, you, will, you will be able to pick out some of these things even as we go over some, 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 some of the, the, other, ones, right. the other stages. You right. know. Yeah, I mean, so we're only on stage four, right? And so we have six more stages of genocide to cover, and there's already been so much that we've been able to share with our audience. And so we hope that this has been informative and educational.